Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you all, so many familiar faces. Welcome to today's webinar. Let's wait a couple of seconds while we let everybody join in. Nice to see you all. Just in case you were wondering, you are in the webinar of the OGP Local Deep Dive. We're gonna be talking today about gender and inclusion and open government. Nice to see some familiar names. Good, good, good. As we wait for everybody to join us, we'll start in just one second. Excellent. Good. Hello, everybody. Excellent. Okay, so I see that folks already know the drill. Um, let me start actually by looking at the live interpretation. So everybody, it's nice to have you here. Uh, we do have interpretation today. Um, it's an AI interpretation that we offer you, so you can listen in different um, languages. And you can see my screen. I hope those are the instructions for you to be able to use that AI interpretation. As you can see there, you can grab your cell phone, you can scan the code, and through that, you will be able to um, select the language in which you would want to listen. Now, in today's webinar, we're going to be speaking in English and in Spanish. First half is going to be in English. Second half is going to be in Spanish. Okay? So make sure you have your phones handy. And you can see there the instructions. You can look at the captions and read the captions. Or you can also um, select to listen uh, the live interpretation. Good. Now, let me go back one and um, invite you, you know, to um, please introduce yourself, as many of you have been doing. Uh, we're all now getting accustomed to introducing ourselves in the chat, and that's great. If you can, we would invite you to turn on your camera. It is always good to see your peers, your friends, with whom you are connecting within this community. Please uh, continue to move your mics. We are a big crowd, so it's always good so we can hear what's going on. Nevertheless, we encourage you to participate, stay focused, take some notes, and to contribute. And the way in which we would like you to take part is using the chat box. Now, um, during our last webinar, if you were there, we had a very lively chat conversation, and we have our colleagues as well as the presenters are going to be very um, attentive to the chat to be able to answer some of your questions. So please use your uh, your chat box to answer some of, uh, to ask your questions and we also will get some answers there. The last thing is that this session will be recorded for learning purposes. I hope that's okay with everybody. Good. Now, what are we going to be talking about today? I think it's a very relevant and important topic. And it, we're going to be talking about gender and inclusion. And one of the reasons why we put this webinar as our second webinar is because it is one of our most popular topics by members to develop some of the commitments. I think it's not surprising to any of us. We've been talking um, again and again about this closeness that local governments have with the people, but that also means the closeness with all these different communities. Now, one in four of our current commitments that we have from our local members relate to inclusion. And these commitments usually are more often paired with, for example, an inclusion and participation mechanism, but also they relate to inclusion and transparency or inclusion and open data, just to mention a few. And these commitments have reminded us that you know, open government can help bring in excluded groups into, uh, into the community. 
And it is important to remind us that those different groups have different needs, which open government approaches can respond to. Now we have a stellar group today that I'm really excited to be uh, presenting to you today. Today we'll be speaking and hearing about how open government has been used to improve policies and programs in four different groups. This is by no means an exhaustive list of groups of people that we might want to engage, but it is useful to give us a flavor of what can be done and give us some inspiration to look at our own communities and ask ourselves how we can make our governments more inclusive. Now, before moving forward, I would like to ask you a really brief question on the survey you're going to see soon pop up. A uh, quick question on the quiz. Um, good. So these questions are, first one is, what is your level of expertise on the subject of gender and inclusion? This is good for us to get a sense of your knowledge level. You can, of course, be a master, a Jedi, um, you know, uh, super knowledgeable. Maybe you're confident, but not necessarily a master. You've heard about the topic, but you really want to know more. Or this is perhaps the first time that you are learning about this topic. The second question is whether you already incorporate initiatives that promote gender perspective or inclusion in your daily work. Now, as you answer that uh, poll, that question that we have, I wanted to tell you about the agenda that we have for you today. Now, we're going to start as we did last time with a keynote speaker, and we'll have an opportunity to uh, get some questions and answers. As I said, please, the questions and answers uh, through the chat, and we'll bring them out, but also we will answer them some directly. Then we'll have some panelists that will be talking about youth, the elderly and persons with disabilities. We will then talk about the Open Gov Challenge, which is a main drive that we have at OGP. Where we want to make sure that we see more ambitious commitments around open government in different topics. And of course, we would be remiss not to um, include some of opportunities of our key partners that are working with us in terms of um, uh, gender and inclusion overall. Now, looking at some of your answers before we move forward. Um, it's good to see that uh, a good percentage of you are uh, not a master, but are confident in the topic. And it's also very interesting to see that just about half of you want to know more about this topic. And this is the right place to be, to be able to know more about what's going on. Also, a large percentage of you, 80% actually, of the ones who have answered this survey do incorporate those initiatives and promote gender um, perspective and inclusion in your daily work. So if you already are working on these topics, do share with us with different, from different, uh, by uh, different channels, uh, all the work that you're doing, we always like to know more. We have an OGP, a uh, gender and inclusion circle, learning circle, where we would love to hear more about the work that you've been doing. Now, let me stop on the quiz and let me show you who are our uh, speakers uh, today. And we are going to be starting with Laura Newman. We'll be um, starting with her as our keynote speaker. She is a senior advisor at the College Center and she leads the Inform Women Transform Lives campaign. She's also an incoming civil society steering committee members of OGP. And she'll be talking to us to kick us off um, uh, on the topic of gender and um, open government. So Laura, I'm going to give you um, access to be able to move the slides at your own um, pace. That will happen in one second. And you can uh, kick us off. Thank you, Laura. Oh, let me get to, okay. Um, there you go, I'm sorry, we had a little mic. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, well, hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here with you all this morning, this afternoon, and this evening. Um, thank you so much to um, Jose Maria and your team at OGP Local for offering me this opportunity to speak um, for a few minutes about gender and inclusion, particularly at the local level. I'm going to start by apologizing about my voice. Um, as I told a few others, uh, I've been at the Carter Center for 25 years. And last night we celebrated uh, former president Jimmy Carter's 100th birthday. And we did it with a very big concert of many, many well-known artists from around the world. And I was incredibly engaged. <laughs> so I did a lot of screaming and a lot of cheering and a lot of crying. Um, so apologies for, for my voice, but uh, hopefully it'll continue for the next 10 minutes or so um, as we talk a bit about this. So let me see how I can control these slides. Well, there you go. Um, so I'd like to start today by telling you a story uh, about this woman, a little bit about her life. This is uh, Anna Varelis. Um, and if anybody can't hear me or if I'm going too fast, please just let me know in the chat. Um, Anna Varelis is from Guatemala City. And Anna uh, had been married. She'd been in an abusive relationship. She had two daughters. Her husband had died, uh, leaving her nothing. And because she had so little, everything she had, she gave to her daughters. She became um, incredibly ill and incredibly malnourished. She was unable to support her family. She was really depressed uh, and she was on the streets. And one day a neighbor saw her on the street in, in front of a center, a women's center. And she said, you know, Anna, what's happening? We need to get you some supports. And Anna said, but there's nothing for me here. And she said, but Anna, you're in front of the municipal women's center where you can get free healthcare and medicine and psychosocial supports. Anna had no idea this existed. The city was doing incredible things. They had all kinds of services, but unless people knew about these services, they didn't really matter. Although the city was transparent and open and accountable, again, they needed to do something more. Ultimately, the, the story is a wonderful one for Anna, and, and you can see her story on the Carter Center website. She got this, the care that she needed uh, through the city services. She was able to open a torteria, a little uh, front store where she made uh, tortillas with her daughters. Um, she now is a, a breadwinner. She's um, clearly still uh, has some struggles, but is, you know, is surviving and, and in some ways very much thriving. So what is the value? I'd like to step back now and talk a little bit about the value of open government for women. When governments are open, when they're accountable, when they're transparent and when they're participatory, information can flow. And with that, women can make better decisions for herself and her family. Women can access the government services and harness those available opportunities, such as allowances or health, training and income generation programs. They can participate more fully in, uh, in public life. With more open government, women can know and exercise uh, the plethora of rights that exist, and it supports greater power balance between men and women. But there's lots of reasons why women are not engaging. And I think it's important for us as we start to consider the ways that cities can be more open and, and also be uh, better partners to women to really understand what are some of those barriers. Uh, the first and perhaps the most uh, obvious is that uh, illiteracy. So two thirds of the world's illiterate are women. There's also a lack of awareness of rights and services and how to access them. Um, I will say that the Carter Center has been working in the area of, of women and the right of access to information um, for 15 years now. And when we first started, uh, it was because we had recognized uh, that women were largely not at the table when it came to, came to issues of open government uh, and the right to information. At that time, um, President Carter was super engaged and I went and said to him that I thought that there was an inequity and he challenged me to prove it. And so we did a study uh, at that time in three different countries, 1,700 interviews. We visited 135 public agencies three times each. Um, and we were able to demonstrate that women are not able to access information with the same ease, frequency, or rate of success as men. 
And the second part of that study was why, what are those obstacles? And these, uh, this list comes from, from that study that was done. Uh, it was in three very different places in the world. We wanted to demonstrate that it had nothing really to do with region or hemisphere um, or culture, that it was really about being a woman. And so we did the study in Liberia, in West Africa, in Guatemala, in Central America, and in Bangladesh, so in Asia. Um, and and these were what this is what we found. And then also in terms of continuing the work, this is what we saw. So um, so women face a double burden, as we know, of income generation and caring for her family. So even in the study, when we asked women, are you interested in information, public information? Are you interested in participating? 95% uh, said yes. Um, uh, or the experts and, and um, civil leaders said that women were, uh, but that there was a lack of time. Um, even though there was a great interest, it was difficult for women to engage issues with mobility and transportation. Um, as many of you know, who work for cities, there is an issue of safety in the streets. Uh, public safety for women is, is an increasing problem. Um, one third, 35% of women have faced gender-based violence. For the last 20 years, homicides around the world have gone down, except for one area, and that's femicide, which continues to increase. Um, in addition, there's cultural norms that discourage women from seeking information, uh, from asking uh, the powers for information. Digital divide is still very real and something that uh, we don't have a lot of time to talk about today, but I think as city leaders, the more that you put out uh, through your websites, the actual less that women are able to have that equity, that equality, because for many women, that digital divide continues. Um, often we saw that governments weren't focusing on issues or information relevant to women, and there was um, someone not supportive of her engaging and getting that information, whether that was a family member or public servant, and um, one of the stories we heard a lot, especially in Bangladesh, is as women, for example, tried to engage, it was not their husbands who said no, but their mother-in-laws who said, you know, put your hand down, don't be part of this, this is not right for you to be involved. Um, so facing all of those barriers uh, and recognizing uh, both the importance of information and engagement for women, but also these barriers, uh, the Carter Center started um, uh, we, we held a big uh, event here at the center. We brought a hundred people together to say, what should we do? What can we as a global community do? And uh, the response was, we need to raise awareness of this problem and we need to do more to support women. Um, at that point, there was a decision to do a global campaign called Inform Women Transform Lives. Initially, the campaign was gonna be done at the national level, um, but two things happened at the same time. Uh, to help us recognize that where we really needed to work was locally. And apologies to all of you who are local governments, this is gonna be very obvious to you. It took us a little bit longer to figure out that really the information and the engagement most important to women was at the local level. We looked at over a thousand information requests that we had supported across three different countries and the vast majority were for information held by local government. Um, and you actually care more about your citizens. You're much more proximate and much more willing to be creative uh, in terms of trying new things. So we, we developed the campaign at the, at the local city level. Um, and here are some of the goals of the campaign. Uh, we wanna raise awareness of women's right to information. We wanna support cities to be more innovative and intentional in engaging and reaching women to help build city capacity to, and this is perhaps most important, to increase the number of women receiving information and those essential municipal services that you have so that women like Anna Verilis are never dying on the streets in front of centers where those incredible services exist. And we wanna establish the cities who are part of the campaign as world leaders and drivers of change for a more inclusive, informed and empowered society. So in the few minutes I have left, I just wanna mention a little bit about the campaign and some of its impacts. So I'm, here are the campaign cities. So there's uh, 35 cities at the moment. Uh, we are gonna be increasing that. Uh, I wanna just recognize that a number of the cities who are part of the campaign. I've seen uh, representatives are here today. So I'm thrilled to see you all. 
um, cities apply to be part of the campaign. And once they're selected, each city decides its own service that it wants to highlight through the campaign. So cities have selected anything from services for gender-based violence to um, loans and grants to training opportunities, uh, caregiver services, um, municipal identification cards, waste management, maternal health. Um, again, it's up to the city to say, here's a service that we have that's being underutilized because women don't know it exists, because we haven't been able to reach women with awareness or access to those services. So the Carter Center doesn't say like, hey, we're so excited to crowd that you're gonna be part of the campaign, here's what you have to work on. Each city does its own assessment and in many cases goes back into the community to talk to women about what services um, she needs most in order to be economically empowered or to promote and protect her rights. Once the cities are part of the campaign, uh, there's a number of different elements. So the city um, doesn't receive any money, but we do provide uh, funds for a communications campaign. So to do things, again, differently, recognizing that what's being done on a day-to-day -day basis is not sufficient to reach women. So we support them in developing a more integrated, a more comprehensive, um, and really more intentional plan to communicate with women in their communities. Uh, the cities, again, decide which women. So in some cases, it's women of a certain age. Uh, in other cases, it's women who live in certain parts of the city or different ethnic minorities or um, women who um, are of different, I mean, again, different abled women. So each, um, each city decides both their service and the women they want to, to address. Um, we also do a small grants project for community organizations to get involved and a mural project, um, as well as a lot of lessons and, and sharing, um, much like uh, we're so impressed with OGP Local and their ability to share across cities, and we, we do something a bit similar. So I'd like to just share a few of the examples of what can happen when cities do become more open, but also more, um, more intentional and more innovative when it comes to gender inclusion. So the first one on the left is a mural that was done in Kampala as part of the campaign. So in Uganda, Kampala decided to work on economic empowerment for women. They had a, a, grants pro, a loan and grants project where they had funding to provide to cooperatives of women who came together for small businesses. And what happened is that um, they were about to lose all that money. It was gonna be taken back by the national government because they weren't able to get it out. They weren't getting enough good applications. Women didn't know it existed. So they highlighted this as part of the Inform Women Transform Lives campaign. They got 600% more um, applications. So they went from 50 applications to 300. Um, but importantly, they were able to get out $250,000 uh, in a short period of time to different women's organizations, whether it was women who um, were starting a bakery or women doing um, textiles. Uh, it was the first time they were able to push out such an incredible amount of money and the impacts have been amazing uh, in terms of those cooperatives of women and what they were able to do. And the middle next one over uh, is from Bogota. So in Bogota, they decided to focus on their caregivers. Um, I'm sure you all have had an opportunity to hear from Bogota. Um, they're very outspoken about this incredible program that they started to provide services for caregivers uh, and in these, in these centers, um, but they still felt they weren't reaching certain populations. So they focused on uh, certain areas of the city. They found that they went from a 20% awareness of their services to 50% and they increased the number by 2,400 of women receiving caregiver services. Um, the one next to it is Nairobi. In Nairobi, they focused on gender-based violence, uh, which is an incredible problem, um, and, and femicide. The, the sign in the back that says 1508, that's a phone number that they have, a hotline. They were averaging 80 calls a month. After the campaign, it went up to 700 calls a month related to gender-based violence and seeking services that the city has. Um, it's you know, a little bit hard to celebrate that. On the one hand, we're really pleased that because of the campaign, so many more women were able to learn and hear about the services. On the other hand, to think that on a regular basis, 700 calls are coming in uh, a month 
related to gender-based violence just again shows us how much more we need to do to really assure that our cities are um, not only inclusive and equitable, but safe um, for all women. I mean, my final example, and I, I can keep going, I've got obviously a lot of energy about this and, and a lot of great examples of how cities have made such a difference for women by being more open um, and transparent and, and participatory. But the last one is actually Chicago. So in, um, in Chicago, they decided to work on something called the City Key, which is a municipal identification card that opens the door to all kinds of other services, whether that's um, public transportation or the libraries or reduced fees for medications, uh, et cetera. And they really highlighted the north and south of the city, which were areas um, of more women of color, uh, Latinas, and also socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, through the, the campaign, they had a 225% increase in the number of city keys that they were able to distribute. Uh, and uh, over 75% of that was in the catchment area. So in those areas in which uh, the city really wanted to focus. Um, and these kinds of services, you all know this, these change people's lives, these change women's lives. So I just wanted to, again, connect this idea of being an open government, that there's a reason for it. And the reason is because you will transform not just those women who are touched by your services uh, and, by, and by your engagement with them, but also their families and then whole communities. Um, so with that, I know I've probably gone over my time. Um, let me pause and see if there's any questions. And again, I can just like, keep going all day, but... Um, but let me see, uh, Jose Maria, there's some questions. Thank you, Laura. Yes, thank you. Well, one request is if you could just please pop in the chat some of the um, links to these reports that you mentioned at the very beginning, as well as the um, um, program and, and this campaign that you are, uh, you know, that you're leading. So, you know, check on the uh, on the chat and let's try to answer them some uh, of the questions there. And before we move forward for the next speaker, I really want to say, you know, that is an amazing way to kick off this conversation about gender inclusion and open government because you put a face to really what we're all trying to do, right? Which is to help people, but people. Our communities, our citizens are not monolithic. They're not a single, you know, uh, unit. And being an open government is being an open government for all. So we have to be very, very mindful of uh, the differences that uh, these groups, uh, you know, have in terms of their lived experiences, their problems, but also the solutions that we uh, propose moving forward. Um, an open government that is open to most, but not open to all, is not uh, good enough. Now, turning to another uh, group that we know, um, you know, has uh, a keen interest in being heard. Uh, and to this day, there are about 1.2 billion um, people in this age range, which is 15 to 24, and I'm talking about the youth. So, we have um, one of our colleagues who is Jaco Roitz. He is the Global Training and Incubation Manager at Accountability Lab, an organization that has championed youth engagement in open government for many years and is a pioneer in this work within the partnership. So, um, Jaco, I think that you should be able to start your um, presentation. And in the meantime, we'll keep an eye on the chat for some questions and answers for Laura. Keep them coming in. Jaco, you should be ready to go. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And, and Laura, thank you for that amazing introduction. And I think specifically before I start, uh, so my name is Jaco, by the way, I'm from South Africa. Um, I think one of the powerful things that, that grounds me in my work as well as Laura spoke about Anna from Guatemala that gives open government a face and, and the kind of people that we want to pull into, into this. Um, it also reminded me that, you know, the question about are we like master Jedi's or are we still apprentices um, or are we like still learning, just entering into this? Um, I always enter into the space with humility and empathy 
So I wouldn't call myself a master Jedi. I'm definitely not a youth expert because I'm far from being a youth right now. But I'm very curious in what young people are saying. And I think when we enter into these conversations with empathy and humility, it changes um, what we what we see. Sorry, now my slides jumped. So a few reflections, and these are really just reflections on my side. Um, the when we think about how do we open government for the inclusion of youth, a few key questions for me again, pointing back to humility and empathy, is that the youth should be co-creators in the space, not just participants. We're not just working with them, but there's an energy here that we need to harness. Um, and for that to happen, we also need to understand how the youth are talking about governance issues that affect them on a daily basis. Um, and it all, also broadens our understanding that young people won't only talk about how governance of issues affect them as young people, but they will also see how their parents, their older generations being affected, including people that are very young. So they think about it in a broader perspective than just um, what, what we often get stuck into. And then a big question for me is, are we just inviting people to existing spaces? Um, we create these beautiful platforms, um, toolkits, designs, and then we say, okay, come in and we want to hear from you. And I think on the other side is, are we meeting people where they are already engaged, spaces that they've invented themselves, um, ways of talking? So in essence, for me, the core thing is that we need to shift what we think we know about particular spaces so that that's a few questions that I think should guide us in how we move forward. So what Accountability Lab does, and I'm just sharing a few of snapshots, I can share more details, but in Zimbabwe, for example, with our Voice to Rep campaign, we invite uh, young social socially conscious artists to write music. So here you can see in Tetel, um, she does songs about mental health, gender-based violence, cultural erosion, and the importance of civic action against corruption, but it engages young people in a different way, in language that they already use on a daily basis. It doesn't ask them to use professionalized, um, sanitized language. Um, in Somaliland, uh, that's photo on the right, we have these World Cafe sessions that run with our 2024 Integrity Summit in Hargeisa. So here you see young people talking about how do we how do we reimagine the civil service? What does good governance look like for us on the ground? And what role can we play as young people to support those that are seen as reformers within this governance space? So it's not just about sharing your dreams, but also saying, what can you do to help this uh, move forward? Um, in the DRC, here you can see our film fellows hitting the streets. Um, so our film fellows go through a, a training course, well, a, a reflection course, really, um, to think about how their own views connect to integrity and accountability. And from here, they, they write, direct and produce films that are aimed at raising awareness. And they advocate for the fight against corruption, accountability, transparency, and integrity. Um, so it's also using films as a, as a medium to reach out. And then everything counts. So Sanju Sherpa is one of our um, incubator participants in Nepal. Um, and here they perform a drama and dance art piece called Bumi, it's land. And the piece is really about the abilities, the failures, and also the role that the youth play in the future development of Nepal. So multiple touch points to, to ignite the agency of young people. So in 2021, we had the um, OBG Youth Summit, oh, the OBG Summit in Korea, and we had youth delegates from all over the world joining the summit. And Accountability Lab is working with a whole range of stakeholders on the OBG Youth Toolkit. Um, so we presented this toolkit to our participants to get feedback and ideas. And I think that's kind of one of the feedback loop components that we also need to talk about
think is for the youth. And I just wanted to capture their voices here because they are the lived experts. Um, but Raphael just thought about the normalization of youth participation. It's not a, only about making sure that youth, that the youth voice is included, but it's normalized, right? It's for the benefit of the entire country. Uh, Shang talked about young people that can feel the utility of politics, uh, which adds to what Gilson was thinking about with resources allocated based on the gaps that people see. And Ilma spoke about that it's a part of decision-making, not just tokenism. So inclusion is more than just saying we have a young person. It is a space of agency and shifting the power. And Laura also reflected about that. And Fabio just said, like, you know, seeing what you wanted in a law after you sat at the decision-making table. So again, it's that sense of accomplishment. Um, so I think a type of government that is for the youth is one that goes beyond just consulting with the youth. When we think about the tools, policies, or approaches that we can consider, um, I mean, I shared a few of Accountability Lab's approaches um, in terms of getting to the youth, but we can be creative here. There are multiple different ways uh, to, to get around this problem. Um, but the guiding points for me is more important when we are creative using these as our value guides. Um, so we need to create a really enabling environment for youth participation. Um, and that's again about the invented versus invited spaces. Um, in that we can build on the capacity energy and momentum of young people. So we're not just instructing them and dragging them through a professionalized system, but we're actually um, learning from them as well, um, harnessing what they have and taking that forward because they are the future leaders. Um, in this, we create partnerships and collaboration. It, it doesn't just become a, older people will teach the youth what to do, but it becomes everyone brings something to the table. Everyone can learn even older generations can learn from the youth. And that ensures meaningful representation, not just face dressing and now we have a young person here, but real being able to exert agency and speak to power. Um, and through all of this, I think it's really important to recognize and celebrate youth that stand out and to create them as models that can inspire others to do the same. Um, so in all with youth, I think it's it's a mindset uh, and not as much the technicalities around it, but it's how we enter the process. Um, and I think that, oh, and then, you know, just young people bring diverse perspectives, fresh ideas and innovative approaches. We need to understand that this is a value contribution as well. They have a unique experience. They have specific challenges and they have aspirations that make them valuable in shaping what our society looks like in the future. Empathy should ground us. And if we involve youth in governance processes, but with this empathy approach, then we can foster inclusivity and diversity, ensuring that all voices are heard. And I think often a warning sign should be if we want to be the ones that, that decide on what is at the table and who is at the table, that can be mirrored and become exclusionary in its own right. So if we truly believe that there's an energy here, that there's something we can learn, people that participate are also open to learn from others. And that will deepen inclusivity and diversity and hearing of all voices. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Jack. That's really, really interesting. Um, to highlight, I really like the fact that you made emphasis on the mentality to really be able to open um, rather than, you know, focusing solely on, on the methods, right? I mean, through the work that we've done of, of OGP and the forums and the spaces for collaboration, you know, it's really about is knowing who to target and inviting them to that table and having that initial discussion um, as well. And, and we know the power of, of youth uh, and that how that can really transform the way we think and see the different problems. Now, there are a couple of questions that have come up on the chat that I think will be really interesting. 
um, to reflect on for all the our speakers. And one of them is, you know, how do we, what do we do to be able to transform organizational cultures? You know, whether they're male dominated or whether they're older people dominated. You know, maybe one idea is that that transformation of the culture comes through practice and exposure. And the more that we can engage with these groups and understand where they're coming from, the the more that we can empower them not only to be part of, of government and, and break that, um, you know, that stereotype that governments are just by uh, older, you know, uh, men of a uh, certain uh, color or race, but also, um, you know, a, open up for uh, new, more diverse uh, governments. Now, we're going to switch to Spanish. So if you haven't done so already, please grab your phone, scan the QR code, and select your language, because now we're going to be speaking in Spanish. And we are going to move from um, the youth and going to the other side of the spectrum. And, we're going to be talking about initiatives that focus on the elderly population. And for this, we have Rafael Lopez Arostegui. Uh, he is an advisor of social policy in the Basque Country government, one of our members that has been with OGP since 2016. He's been working with youth and the elderly for many, many years, and he's going to share with us um, a commitment that uh, the Basque Country is now implementing that seeks to engage with this elderly population. Eh, Rafa, te doy ahora eh, el micrófono. Si me das un segundo. Y o creo que ya estás listo para hablar, ¿cierto? Ahora deberías de estar. Ahora sí. Gracias. Gracias, María. Eh, ahora sí tengo acceso. Vale. vale. Bueno, eh, primero gracias por la oportunidad a todas y a todos los que estamos compartiendo este espacio de, de participar en, esta, en este webinar y compartir y aprender. Gracias a Laura y a Jacob también por la, por la presentación y... Bueno, mi idea es contaros eh, un proyecto concreto que es Alchor, que en nuestra lengua en, en euskera significa tesoro, pero enmarcar el proyecto en, en un marco general de relación de la administración pública, del sector público, con la sociedad civil y en particular con las personas mayores. Eh, el proyecto se, se encuadra en la, en la estrategia vasca con las personas mayores y queríamos subrayar el, el CON y a raíz de la puesta en marcha de esta estrategia en la legislatura anterior eh, se generó una comisión dentro de lo que llamamos la mesa de diálogo civil de Euskadi. En la mesa de diálogo civil están representadas todas las redes de organizaciones del tercer sector social y los distintos departamentos del gobierno. Una de las comisiones, se trabaja por comisiones y en las comisiones se trabaja por proyectos. Y una de las comisiones está configurada por las redes de asociaciones de personas mayores. Esto es EAB, Euskadi Coadini Poem, Bachor de A en Euskera. Vale. Eh, para nosotros, para poder trabajar con la sociedad civil, desde este principio de diálogo civil, eh, es muy importante la articulación, la propia articulación del tercer sector en un ámbito determinado, sea mayores o exclusión o discapacidad o infancia, adolescencia y juventud, eh, y que esa articulación funcione adecuadamente y además que haya procesos participativos dentro de las propias organizaciones de tercer sector para que se cumpla lo que dice el principio de diálogo civil. El principio de diálogo civil está reconocido en en nuestra ley de tercer sector, la ley vasca de tercer sector social, eh, procede del ámbito de la discapacidad, os explicaré ahora por qué, es importante saber por qué y de dónde viene, y se formula como el derecho de las personas destinatarias de las políticas a participar 
en las políticas públicas en todas sus fases, desde el diseño de la política hasta la evaluación pasando por la ejecución. Esto viene del ámbito de la discapacidad y la ley de tercer sector lo extiende a todo el ámbito eh, social, no solo a discapacidad, mayores, infancia, mujeres, a todo el ámbito de, la, de las políticas sociales y de los destinatarios de las políticas sociales. Está reconocido por ley como derecho y supone una manera distinta de relacionarse desde la administración, en este caso con las personas mayores, pero también con el resto de colectivos. Eh, el gobierno abierto suele implicar un proceso en el que la administración tiene una idea y la somete a discusión. Eh, el, el proceso de diálogo civil es un proceso de co-creación desde el inicio, partiendo del diagnóstico compartido, el diseño de la política, eh, de los proyectos concretos que se van a impulsar, de su evaluación y, en la medida en que se puede, las organizaciones no solo participan en el diseño, sino que participan también en la, en la ejecución. Un elemento que es muy importante es que carecemos de herramientas en el procedimiento administrativo para poder eh, acompañar adecuadamente este tipo de procesos, que entre otras cosas nos llevan no a mecanismos de concurrencia competitiva, sino a generar redes de organizaciones que trabajan de forma cooperativa en el desarrollo de una idea de un proyecto en el que han intervenido desde el inicio pero el procedimiento administrativo no suele ajustarse a esto. Vale. Bueno, esto por un lado. Por otro lado, eh, la pandemia nos ha permitido entender que teníamos que hacer una diferenciación entre políticas estables en un contexto social eh, tranquilo, en el que no hay demasiados cambios, a, a diferenciarlas de las políticas de urgencia que tuvimos que poner en marcha en la pandemia, y de, de las políticas de transición, que son las que tienen que ver con el contexto social en el que estamos, eh, en ebullición, en el que hay muchísimos factores en transformación. ¿vale? Eh, parte de ese contexto es el envejecimiento de, de, de las sociedades como la nuestra, como la vasca, pero no, no solo eso plantea, por ejemplo, un reto en el ámbito de los cuidados, desde la crisis del modelo tradicional de cuidados, y afecta también a la igualdad de mujeres y hombres, ¿vale? y al modo en que desempeñamos todos y todas los distintos roles sociales. Cada vez desempeñamos roles sociales más diversos y nuestros itinerarios vitales son cada vez más diversos, a diferencia de lo que sucedía en el pasado. Bueno, a eso va a responder también el, el proyecto que, que os voy a presentar. En la diapositiva podéis ver algunos ejemplos de cómo se caracterizan, por qué se caracterizan las políticas estabilizadas y qué características tienen las políticas de transición. En el ámbito de los mayores ya, era muy habitual que las políticas estuvieran centradas en las necesidades, no en necesidades y capacidades, y en las destinatarias, ¿eh? entendiéndolas como receptoras de la atención y no, no como constructoras o como agentes de la atención o de las políticas. Estaban muy centradas también en la atención a la dependencia y en Euskadi lo siguen estando. En el final de la vida, por tanto, en muchos casos, cuando hablamos de mayores, ¿eh? no a lo largo del curso vital. Y como un dato, el 20% de las personas mayores en Euskadi, en el País Vasco, están en situación de dependencia. Pero no teníamos políticas para y con las personas mayores autónomas, que son la gran mayoría. La, el, el foco estaba puesto en el envejecimiento activo, desde la idea de prevención y de inversión para evitar un gasto sanitario futuro y no en eh, el desarrollo de una vida plena, en la capacidad de las personas para construir su propio proyecto vital con autonomía y autodeterminación. Y las fórmulas de participación eran las tradicionales, eh, por recordar un ejemplo extremo eh, desde el ámbito político, eh, reunirse con las asociaciones de personas mayores justo antes de la campaña electoral o invitarles a una comida. Eh, y estaban, las políticas estaban centradas en el desarrollo del sistema de protección, en el sistema público. ¿no? En el marco de las políticas de transición nos fijamos en necesidades y capacidades, entendemos a las personas como destinatarias pero también como agentes, no trabajamos solo con las personas dependientes, sino también con personas mayores, autónomas y frágiles. 
no ponemos la atención en las residencias y la dependencia, sino en el medio comunitario, también en el medio comunitario. Impulsamos nuevas formas de participación, como el diálogo civil, que responden a las nuevas expectativas de las nuevas generaciones de personas mayores. Tratamos de impulsar su vida plena y que con autonomía y autodeterminándose decidan de manera individual o en pareja qué proyectos de vida quieren desarrollar a nivel individual, de pareja o colectivo con impacto en la comunidad. Y no nos centramos solo en el desarrollo de sistemas públicos, sino que entendemos que lo que promovemos son ecosistemas locales en los que necesidades y capacidades se articulan para buscar mejores respuestas a problemas complejos desde la cooperación. Vale. Bueno. En, desde esa perspectiva estamos desarrollando distintos proyectos que tienen que ver con los tránsitos vitales. Os voy a hablar brevemente de Alchor, que es un proyecto centrado en, el tránsito, en los tránsitos vitales entre los 60 y los 100 años de edad. Pero desarrollamos también otros proyectos similares en el tránsito a la emancipación con jóvenes o en el tránsito que suponen los procesos migratorios a las personas que deciden eh, iniciar un proyecto de vida en, en Euskadi. Y esta idea de acompañar tránsitos es muy importante y hacerlo desde la libre determinación de cada persona. Sabéis que en el ámbito de la discapacidad el principio de autodeterminación para ese ámbito es clave y la plena inclusión es ser protagonistas activos de la, de la sociedad también. Por eso esos conceptos son nucleares en el principio de diálogo civil y se han extendido desde el ámbito de la discapacidad a otros colectivos. Bueno, eh, el proyecto lo estamos construyendo desde la Comisión de Mayores de la Mesa de Diálogo Civil de Euskadi, eh, Euskadi Coanico en Bachor de A. Empezamos con ellos desde este principio de diálogo civil eh, a diseñar prototipos. Para eso hicimos un informe eh, en base a tres fuentes distintas. Las aportaciones de la Comisión de Mayores, un proceso de consultoría especializada y una encuesta. La encuesta se realizó a, a pie de calle con 600 personas de 60 a 100 años. Y esas fueron las fuentes para diseñar los prototipos. A partir de ahí, desde el gobierno, hicimos un proceso de diseño de pliegos para una licitación eh, que incluían aspectos como el espacio y el mobiliario, la asistencia técnica prestada en el servicio o la generación de un ecosistema digital, una comunidad virtual sobre itinerarios de tránsito eh, a esa etapa de la vida entre los 60 y, y los 100. Y en este momento estamos resolviendo el contrato y se va a poner en marcha el proyecto en las tres capitales vascas inicialmente. Eh, el servicio no es un servicio de información y no es una ventanilla única. No se trata de centrar, el, poner el foco en la información, sino en ofrecer a la persona, a la pareja o a un colectivo de personas mayores una orientación personalizada que tiene un carácter proactivo, que se hace cargo y es consciente de cuál es su proyecto e intenta acompañarles en el desarrollo del proyecto de manera proactiva, captando información, poniéndoles en contacto con otras personas, generando recursos de apoyo... Bueno, y cuando hay proyectos colectivos, procuramos que tengan un impacto en la comunidad. Bueno, eh, se trabaja con ellos en elementos que tienen que ver con el diseño de los apoyos que van a necesitar y con la activación de capacidades, no solamente pensando en las necesidades que tienen y los apoyos que precisan, sino en qué capacidades tienen y pueden desarrollar y proyectar socialmente. Y se generan comunidades presenciales y virtuales. Hay una comunidad online de Alchor en el que las personas comparten cómo están entendiendo ese tránsito, qué proyectos tienen, qué soluciones están buscando, qué iniciativas están poniendo en marcha. Bueno, desde la perspectiva de eh, Open Government Partnership, eh, Euskadi Coñi con Bachordea, la comisión ha funcionado como grupo de compromiso vinculado al foro regular, ha habido un grupo de contraste institucional, hemos contrastado sobre todo con los ayuntamientos cómo debieran ser los servicios también y se han realizado también contrastes en foro abierto. Y ya para finalizar, deciros que este proyecto está conectado con otros dos. 
un proyecto que se llama Visicha Betea, otro el Duax Avalchen, Visicha Betea es vida plena en, Eus en, en euskera, el Duax Avalchen es eh, abriendo las oportunidades de, de las personas mayores. Eh, el Visicha Betea es un proyecto de capacitación para el tránsito. Las personas necesitan nuevas competencias, entonces hacemos un programa de capacitación en el desarrollo de competencias para el tránsito a esa nueva etapa vital y a lo largo de ella. ¿Vale? Y el otro proyecto es un proyecto de transformación de los centros sociales de mayores, que en lugar de ser o responder a un modelo de hogar de jubilado, jugar a, reunirse para jugar a cartas, sin proyección en la comunidad, dentro del espacio del centro, responden a un modelo abierto que integra perfiles y generaciones distintas de mayores y que incluye enfoques intergeneracionales. Hemos hecho algunas acciones piloto, tanto de los proyectos de capacitación como de procesos de transformación de centros de mayores. Y esto es complementario, esto está en marcha ya y es complementario al CHOR. ¿Vale? Implica una nueva manera de relacionarse con las personas mayores, con las nuevas generaciones de personas mayores, que responde a cuál es su expectativa respecto al modo en el que la administración debe relacionarse con, con ellos hoy. Y responde a un contexto social de transición social y demográfica que está caracterizado sobre todo por la búsqueda de la equidad en la diversidad, cada vez mayor de la sociedad, también de la vasca, y por las oportunidades para el desarrollo de itinerarios vitales muy diversos, cada vez más diversos, y el desempeño de nuevos roles sociales, también de las personas mayores, de modo que puedan tener una vida plena y no solo participar en programas de envejecimiento activo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Rafa. Thank you for sharing this experience and the importance of being able to, you know, see that uh, other end of, of the population spectrum that also require, you know, that attention and that need to be able to live dignified lives later on. And very interesting, you know, the multifaceted approach that you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, engaging with, uh, with this community. Now we're going to move from the Basque Country all the way to Chile. We're going to be listening to our colleague Cecilia Jimenez. She is uh, the director of um, Open Government and Control in the municipality of Peñalolén. She has been one of the main drivers of the OGP local action plan in that municipality, including working specifically with inclusion of persons with disabilities. So, Cecilia, um, you are up next. Cecilia, ahora vas tú. Eh, muchas gracias. Uy, no puedo mover la... <laughs> Ahí sí. Eh, bueno, primero dar las gracias al equipo de OGP por estar aquí, a los expositores y a todos los que estamos reunidos para ver cómo podemos mejorar nuestras comunidades a través del gobierno abierto. Eh, yo vengo de Peñalolén, que es una comuna que está a los pies de la cordillera de Santiago de Chile, eh, y es una comuna eh, muy desigual. Yo antes decía muy diversa, pero en realidad la palabra es desigual. Y por lo tanto la inclusión es relevante para nuestra comunidad. Y nuestro eslogan, como dice ahí, es Peñalolén crece para todos y todas. Eh, ¿Me ayuda? Ahí sí. ¿Me ayuda? Perfecto. ¿Cómo relevar las voces de las personas en situación de discapacidad? Eh, bueno, queremos decirles que eh, nosotros hemos aplicado eh, los principios de gobierno abierto, los pilares de gobierno abierto de participación, transparencia y colaboración eh, con, el, con el objetivo de lograr la inclusión de estas personas. Eh, no voy a decirles que hemos logrado la plena inclusión, estamos muy lejos de eso, pero nos gustaría mostrarles cuál ha sido nuestra experiencia para ver si eh, estos aprendizajes que hemos tenido puedan serles de utilidad. Con respecto a la participación, contarles que eh, cuando elaboramos nuestros compromisos del plan de acción de gobierno abierto, en el cual hay uno de, eh, de discapacidad, eh, realizamos diálogos temáticos. Y existió eh, la decisión política de incluir como una temática precisamente la situación de discapacidad eh, porque el, la gestión quiere promover la inclusión de, estas, de esta población. Y fue así como eh, logramos que efectivamente a partir de estos diálogos eh, tuviéramos un compromiso vinculado a las personas en situación de discapacidad. 
Contarles además que cuando hicimos estos, estos diálogos estábamos en pandemia y por lo tanto tuvimos que usar formatos virtuales, eh, lo que nos parecía en un principio muy complejo, pero descubrimos que para el grupo, para las personas en situación de discapacidad y sus cuidadoras y cuidadores, eh, al, eh, en forma totalmente distinta a lo que nosotros pensábamos, sí era un mecanismo adecuado. Muchas veces estas personas no habían acudido a actividades presenciales de participación porque tenían problemas de movilidad, o bien sus cuidadores no podían dejar solo las personas que cuidan, y esta fue eh, una buena alternativa. Y fue un aprendizaje también de que no estábamos quizás utilizando el mecanismo adecuado para promover la participación de estas personas. Eh, con respecto también es importante contarles que en estos diálogos nos dimos cuenta de que no solo teníamos que abordar el tema de las personas en situación de discapacidad, sino también de nuevos actores, los cuidadores y cuidadoras de personas en situación de discapacidad. Que la mayoría, yo diría más del 90%, son mujeres, son familiares de ellos y mujeres. Eh, este grupo que, tiene, que cumplía la labor de cuidar a estas personas, eh, estaba teniendo también dificultades, estaba descuidándose a sí mismo, y por lo tanto surgieron muchas necesidades de índole de salud o incluso de salud mental, porque el trabajo que realizan eh, no les permite desarrollar una vida normal y plena. Eh, por lo tanto fue importante también conocer de esta perspectiva desde ellos mismos, y que era un, un grupo invisibilizado. Eh, también hicimos... En, también como forma de participación, diagnósticos tanto cuantitativos como cualitativos, porque generalmente uno tiene supuestos respecto de la discapacidad que, que en realidad no son reales. ¿ya? Eh, pequeños detalles que solo ellos nos pueden decir cómo se siente vivir en una situación de discapacidad. Eh, a modo de ejemplo, nosotros eh, pensábamos que estábamos llegando a la población sorda con el solo hecho de publicar trámites por escrito en la web o, o físicamente, y ahí nos dimos cuenta de que mucha población sorda solo habla a través de lengua de señas, y por lo tanto tampoco estábamos cubriendo sus necesidades. Eh, y eso, esa realidad, por ejemplo, también eh, en el espacio físico, cuando uno que no tiene problemas de movilidad no percibe ciertos pequeños detalles y una persona en silla de ruedas te dice mira, eh, en, ese, en ese lugar hay una rejilla, mi silla no puede pasar etcétera, por lo tanto es muy relevante poder escuchar de ellos mismos cuáles son sus reales necesidades y no a partir de supuestos eh, también con el objeto de eh, que esta participación se sostuviera en el tiempo, fuera sostenible se generaron mesas de trabajo entre el municipio y las personas en situación de discapacidad para poder no dejar esto solo como eh, el, el punto de partida de un compromiso, sino que se estableciera como una forma permanente de participación. Pasando ahora a, a lo que es la transparencia, en estos diálogos también nos dimos cuenta, como contaba Laura anteriormente, que la gente no sabía de los servicios que tenía el municipio, de los beneficios a los que podía acceder, eh, porque claro, estaban publicados en páginas web, etcétera, pero ellos no los conocían. Entonces logramos hacerlo a través de la transparencia focalizada, intentar acercar el derecho de acceso a información a estas personas, a este grupo. ¿Cómo? A través de mapas de servicios, guías de derechos, difundiendo esta información en el territorio, de manera de que eh, todos pudieran acceder a ella. Y finalmente, en cuanto al pilar de colaboración, eh, podemos señalar que la academia y la sociedad civil han jugado un rol fundamental en la inclusión de personas en situación de discapacidad en nuestra comuna. Ahí estamos viendo un trekking inclusivo con jóvenes con discapacidad cognitiva. Eh, esto se ha logrado a través, bueno, la academia nos ha apoyado fundamentalmente en lo que son los diagnósticos y también en apoyo a la prestación de servicios, por ejemplo, a través de alumnos en práctica del área de la salud. Y Sociedad Civil a través de fundaciones, Fundación con Trabajo, por ejemplo, que es una fundación que busca lograr la inclusión laboral de personas en situación de discapacidad. Y también aquí, en, el, en la foto que estamos viendo, Fundación Tarucas, eh, que nos permitió hacer un, un trekking, trekking inclusivo con jóvenes que probablemente, eh, no, por su discapacidad, no salían a espacios públicos, o sea, a espacios libres como esto, que es un, un parque que tenemos en, en nuestra comuna. Eh, Ahora, ¿cómo entendemos el gobierno abierto para personas en situación de discapacidad? 
Bueno, eh, yo me atrevo a decir que no solo para personas en situación de discapacidad, sino para todas las minorías, ¿ya? Eh, debe ser un gobierno abierto que reconoce la diversidad de realidad y de voces que tenemos en nuestro territorio. El gobierno abierto no puede ser igual para todos, ¿ya? Eh, tenemos que adaptarnos, eh, por ejemplo, a través de mecanismos de participación dirigidos a estos grupos que, que reconozcan su diferencia. Eh, y otro punto importante también es que el gobierno abierto se base en relación a las personas en situación de discapacidad en un enfoque de derecho. Eh, tradicionalmente, históricamente, los gobiernos locales, al menos en nuestro país, estaban orientados a la prestación de servicios eh, de asistencia, ya sea en materia de salud, de rehabilitación pero no entendían a la persona en situación de discapacidad como un sujeto de derechos eh, que tenían, digamos, tienen, quieren ejercer sus derechos plenamente y eh, su, su discapacidad más bien eh, se produce por su interacción con el entorno. En la medida que el entorno cuenta con los mecanismos de ajuste para que ellos puedan ejercer sus derechos, va desapareciendo un poco la discapacidad. Eh, ay, me falta una lámina. Eh, creemos que el gobierno abierto en esta población debe proporcionar los mecanismos de ajuste, como decía, para asegurar su plena inclusión. Tenemos que romper las barreras de participación, y acercar la participación a estas personas que a lo mejor muchas veces no pueden desplazarse o, por ejemplo, necesitan el uso de lengua de señas, etc. Focalizar el acceso a la información pública, porque también como en el caso de las mujeres que vimos anteriormente, eh, muchas veces estas personas están, de, eh, están en su casa, en, prácticamente sin hacer ninguna otra actividad, también le pasa a los cuidadores, necesitamos llegar a ellos con la información. Y finalmente promover la colaboración como una herramienta para lograr la inclusión. Eh, respecto a los mecanismos implementados o las herramientas que hemos utilizado en este, en este proceso, eh, bueno, primero contarles que nuestro compromiso se llama promoción de una gestión amigable e inclusiva para personas en situación de discapacidad. Y agregamos posteriormente y sus cuidadores o cuidadoras, porque como les dije, fue un descubrimiento de que teníamos un grupo invisibilizado que necesitábamos abordar necesariamente. Bueno, primero eh, hemos utilizado la participación focalizada a través de mesas de trabajo, espacios de encuentro, eh, eh, digamos, pudiendo brindar las facilidades para que ellos puedan acceder a, esta, a estos mecanismos de participación. Eh, en segundo lugar, hemos involucrado a estas personas en las medidas de mejoramiento de accesibilidad en el espacio público a través de codiseños. Por ejemplo, eh, mejoramientos en el acceso a establecimientos de salud de municipales, eh, también en, el, en, el, en, en lo que se refiere a los recintos municipales, etc. Pero desde la mirada de ellos, no pensando nosotros qué es lo que les va a servir a ellos. También hemos eh, trabajado en la capacitación a funcionarios tanto sobre el lenguaje inclusivo como sensibilización. Eh, ellos son quienes atienden a nuestro público y muchas veces el desconocimiento hace que eh, involuntariamente caigan en conductas de discriminación. Eh, por otra parte, el, el abordar formas de vinculación específicas según el tipo de discapacidad. Por ejemplo, eh, en el caso de personas ciegas, utilizar la radio como medio de difusión. Bueno, en el caso de personas sordas, lengua de señas, etc. Ir adaptando las formas de vincularnos a través de... Eh, se, a, a, digamos, atendiendo sus especiales características. Eh, también eh, hemos identificado brechas a través de los diagnósticos que les comenté, eh, pudiendo saber de, de, de su, eh, desde de ellos mismos, desde su voz, qué es, cuáles son las necesidades que tienen. Eh, hemos generado espacios de, de colaboración a través de redes vecinales, eh, por ejemplo, en el caso, muchas veces las iglesias o los mismos vecinos apoyan eh, a los cuidadores en cosas tan básicas como ir a comprar al supermercado. Para una persona que está cuidando a alguien muy dependiente, esto se vuelve un problema. Y a través de esa generación de redes, de quienes están más cerca, efectivamente eh, podemos atender esas necesidades que el municipio obviamente no las puede abordar eh, diariamente. Eh, también generaciones de redes entre las mismas personas en situación de discapacidad. Por ejemplo, hay, hay un huerto comunitario que, que agrupa a personas que han tenido secuelas de accidentes cerebrovasculares. Bueno, estas personas han encontrado ahí un, un grupo que, que tienen sus pares, ¿verdad? Le, le, se ha formado un grupo de convivencia y les ha ayudado a reencantarse con la vida también. El programa de apoyo a los cuidadores, eh, 
a través, ahí contarles una experiencia. Nosotros habíamos pensado en hacer actividades recreativas para, cura, para cuidadores, etc. Y ellos nos dijeron, no, nosotros no necesitamos eso, para nosotros es complejo, lo que queremos es un respiro. Es poder tener, por ejemplo, un día a la semana de tiempo libre para poder dormir, descansar, salir, etc. Y eso se hace a través de un programa de cuidadores y también a través de labores de autocuidado. Se formó también una red de cuidadores, eh, hemos avanzado en campañas de sensibilización y en proceso tenemos eh, el desarrollo de una política de cuidado y también la incorporación de un departamento especial de cuidados en la estructura de nuestro municipio. Eh, bueno, hay algunas fotografías, ahí tenemos un compañero, un funcionario que trabaja con nosotros que se llama Matías y que está enseñando lengua de señas a, a otros funcionarios, eh, actividades para nuestra alcaldesa con, con personas en situación de discapacidad y funcionarios que trabajan con ellos, campañas como la del síndrome de Down, en, en que se usan calcetines diferentes como para llamar la atención de que todos podemos, somos diferentes en algún modo. Eh, bueno, esto ha sido un proceso, como les digo, más de descubrimiento. Eh, ojalá que, que esta, lo que les he contado les sirva a ustedes para poder realizar sus compromisos en materia de inclusión de personas en situación de discapacidad, porque es una tarea muy, muy larga, un proceso muy largo, pero por lo menos tenemos que plantear el tema y visibilizar esta problemática. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Cecilia. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, for this. I think it's incredibly instructive to hear these examples, and I take away a couple of um, of sound bites that I think that you said. One is that you know, open government is different for everybody, and which is very, very true. Uh, and sometimes in our efforts, just to push forward and you know make uh, open government the norm we can forget about uh, all the different varieties and efforts that we uh, you know need to make in order to make open government really inclusive for everybody and then the other aspect that i think is very valuable is the that learning journey that you had about the different needs of people and unless we bring these different groups in, uh, discuss with them, chat with them, see their realities. It's very difficult for us to be able to design those services, those mechanisms of interaction that really meet all of their needs. So we've had a very interesting, very uh, rich, rich uh, conversations in the chat. I really like some other reflections that are being made here, including these reflections about intersectionality and how one person is fits in more than one group, right? Uh, uh, and in that sense, it's very important to keep that in mind when we're designing our commitments moving forward, um, the discussion about changing in culture as well. So keep your comments and questions coming uh, along. And as we are right, right on time, I'm going to shift to one of our dear colleagues at OGP to tell us a little bit about the Open Golf Challenge, which is where we want to raise that ambitious um, commitments. Uh, and we think that gender and inclusion is one of you know top priorities for us as a community to make sure open government um, meets the challenge. So Adna, if you could share uh, with us a little bit more about the Open Cup Challenge, particularly with the challenge on gender and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Adna Karameh Oats. I'm uh, with the OGP support unit with the policy and partnerships team. Um, and uh, one of the things that we are doing um, on this team is really, as, as uh, Jose Maria was just saying, uh, raise the ambition um, on, on actions from our membership. Um, this is why the Open Government Challenge um, was uh, launched, um, because we have seen over, you know, the now more than 10 years uh, of, of OGP commitments, some really good uh, work done by members. But we have also recognized that we, it is now time, especially in some areas, that we have to um, raise that ambition um, and uh, uh, work collectively as a partnership if we really want to see um, impactful uh, and, and, and good uh, progress. Um, so the challenge um, is, is uh, geared at that ambition. Um, 
I don't know, Jose Maria, that I can, okay, I was, I don't know if you moved the slides or I did, but in any case, uh, these are the areas um, that we have identified uh, that are uh, critical for strengthening democracies and the areas in which we are strongly encouraging our members to take more ambitious actions um, through through OGP. Um, and uh, gender and inclusion um, is, is a critical one that is not only a, a space of action on its own, but also runs through every single one of these other areas. And I will talk about that um, in, in a moment. Um, so the challenge on gender and inclusion um, is framed um, as, as the following. Um, we are encouraging our members to adopt open government reforms to promote the full participation of women and underrepresented groups politically, socially, and economically. Um, and what does that look like? Um, what are the specific reforms that we suggest um, would rise uh, to this more ambitious uh, action? Um, so examples are uh, members introducing gender targeted reforms, um, such as mechanisms to tackle gender based violence, both online and offline. Um, this is this we see as something that is a problem in, in many OGP countries, but we do not see enough commitments on. So we are really leaning in uh, to to uh, to our members on, on this topic. Um, another example um, of what would be a, an ambitious action in this space are permanent changes in policy, legal, um, or implementation frameworks that better involve underrepresented communities in decision making. You know, we see a lot of one off um, and isolated examples to include groups in pilots, but that is, you know, we need to go beyond that. It needs to be a permanent um, and more concrete uh, long term change. Um, Another uh, example of a challenge action in the space would be to institutionalize um, and or make compulsory the publication of data disaggregated by impacted communities, um, an example being open, open gender uh, data. Um, and then finally, um, what I was referring to uh, in the previous slide, there are gender and inclusion reforms that are in a, you know, can be standalone reforms, but are also critical to mainstream into other challenge areas, for instance, around climate and environment. We know, um, you know, that, that women, for instance, are disproportionately impacted by, by climate change. So in, introducing um, reforms or actions or policies that recognize that, that try to address that, that include civil society in discussions uh, uh, around how to address those issues, for instance, would be a really um, ambitious uh, action from our membership. So those are those are the suggested um, reforms or policies that we recommend under this challenge area. What can you do in terms of participating in the challenge? Um, so uh, there are different ways of participating in the challenge. One is to co-create a relevant commitment in your OGP action plan. So if you are co-creating, you can uh, select one or more commitments in your action plan as a challenge commitment and nominate it as a challenge commitment within that framework. Um, another way is to submit a standalone action or commitment independent of the OGP action plan. So this is something we heard uh, from the bigger community that, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that happen outside of the timeline of an action plan, um, or that there are institutions that are not necessarily uh, involved in an OGP process, but have very interesting ideas. Uh, so this is a way to recognize and to incorporate those actions. Um, and uh, finally, uh, uh, it's uh, to participate, you can submit an entry for the OpenGov awards. Um, we will be launching the awards process in a few weeks. Um, so be watching out um, for, for that announcement on the OGP website. And of course, none of these are mutually exclusive options. You can have uh, you know, a, a, a commitment in an OGP action plan and six months later, um, it may be, uh, something may come up where 
an idea for a standalone action um, uh, comes about. And so it is possible to have both these routes. Um, we just want to really encourage that, that ambition. Um, so uh, if you are interested, please do reach out to the local team or myself um, and we can, we can share more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adna, for that. So we all know now what we mean by ambition in terms of commitments around um, gender and inclusion. Um, and there are many tools and many partners and uh, that can really help you find out, you know, what's that uh, type of commitment that you really want to work on. So one of them is the Open Gov Guide and some others. So please do check uh, online uh, what we have available. But one of our, um, you know, uh, key partners, very dear to us, that I want to introduce now is NDI. And, and representing NDI is Erin Houlihan. Uh, she is a program director. Um, of democratic governance at the National Democratic Institute and is leading the work in promoting democratic governance at the local level, as well as the work on gender inclusion. And they've developed some very interesting tools and work. And I would like to invite her now um, to a little bit close this out a little bit with this, um, you know, with, with the work that they're doing. And then I will come in with uh, some conclusions and next steps for all of us. Erin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and you can show the, the next slide if you would like. Um, so thank you also to, thank you, uh, to OG, uh, the previous one. Yes. <laughs> thank you to our OGP colleagues for inviting us to share um, one of our ongoing activities and also to um, the other participants in this group for their really fantastic presentations. I've been taking copious notes. Um, what I'd like to share with you today is a pilot tool um, or a, a guide that we're working on and gathering lessons that may be of interest uh, to some of you in your cities. It is called the Local Government Gender Assessment and Action Planning Guide. It provides step-by-step um, -step support for local governments working in partnership with civil society organizations in the community, as well as community members to take a gender intentional approach uh, to the daily work of governance. And um, what I think is unique about this tool or what we're trying to do is use it in a way to support local governments to actually apply that gender lens, apply a gender mainstreaming approach to a particular uh, service sector, such as healthcare or policing, um, to a particular community of, of uh, people within their city, such as uh, migrant communities, indigent communities, um, or ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities or to a particular department or institution um, of a local government. So something like um, registering property, registering businesses, um, registering births, planning and zoning, things like that. It's not meant to be an, a catch-all assessment of local government performance uh, in the realm of uh, gender equality. That's too big. It's too overwhelming. So it's intentionally bite-sized and we hope that it can be institutionalized. So just a quick um, overview, it's very aligned with the OGP process and that's why we hope that it will be useful for you. It, um, it basically takes a multi-stakeholder forum that is established by the local government to include women and men, elected officials and civil service leadership, as well as civil society representatives and as appropriate community members themselves. The forum needs to be small enough for work discussions and deliberation, but it also needs to be transparent in its efforts and its processes. This multi-stakeholder forum, which we call the gender assessment team, um, but it could also be a task force or a working group, 
identifies a narrow and specific objective which uh, for a gender diagnosis. So this tacks into what Laura's work is doing um, and much of what uh, our previous colleagues from Chile and, and Spain were talking about, which is looking at and trying to assess how well a particular government service or department actually recognizes and accounts for the diverse gender experiences in the community. So how well it communicates um, available services, how well it is reaching particular diverse groups of women um, and other gender and sexual diverse peoples in the community, whether its internal protocols and procedures are in fact uh, gender responsive or gender transformative. And then you develop an OGP type of gender action plan um, to address your findings, hopefully to remove systemic barriers um, and challenges and to double down or expand upon successes that they're already having. So this is the idea. We're currently piloting this program in Cuenca, Ecuador, where they are assessing the um, gender intentionality within a program that focuses on the reception and integration of migrants. So that's both internal and external migrants. Um, we're also looking at it in Alfonso, Philippines, where they're trying to ins um, infuse gender intentionality into their um, cultural tourism industry. In Kamenitsa and Suhareka, Kosovo, they are looking at um, a gender intentional approach to uh, services for persons with disabilities on the one hand, and on the other, a property registration program. Um, and in Ozergeti, Georgia, they were looking at a small grants program that is gender neutral and how well that is um, servicing women. What I wanted to highlight very quickly is that the current guide is of course not perfect. This is a pilot. And we have learned a lot from our local government partners who we are very grateful for going on this journey with us. Uh, I'm happy to talk about those, but key among them is that as has been highlighted throughout, none of this work should stand on its own. Um, it must be integrated into an existing government priority. There should be a formalized mechanism from the senior leadership in the municipality to adopt this type of approach and to empower the members of the gender assessment team to do this work um, and to obligate other departments to, to engage with them. Um, we also realize that it needs to more intentionally engage with existing gender machinery within national or within local governments. Um, and then a series of other issues about the composition of gender assessment teams. Um, what it's really aimed designed to do is to, um, to help governments who are already interested in taking a more gender intentional and gender equal, uh, equal approach to their work and try to give them a set of resources and tools to do this. And we will be updating the guide next year with these lessons. And we hope to also have some more supportive uh, resources like training materials on desk research, further examples on methods for focus groups and surveys and interviews and other things like that. And I'm, I'm happy to discuss further. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Erin, for sharing with us, uh, you know, this very useful tool. And I'd like to highlight, you know, that importance of that leadership being, uh, you know, uh, decided and, 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 and wanted to uh, apply, uh, uh, you know, a gender or an inclusion lens to the work that uh, they do, both as part of open government, but beyond. So I just wanted to wrap up with a couple of takeaways. I mean, you know that, that you know, the importance, uh, and I, I honestly have to say, this is one of the you know, most powerful webinars that I've seen just looking at the impact that open government can have on, on people. Um, and it's very important to make sure that, you know, open government is open to every person, particularly the ones that need it the most. And we've heard about the different types in which that can happen, either focusing on that information, you know, uh, element of it and being able to know what's happening, being able to make sure that that transparency is really focalized and it enables folks to, 
you know, just even make use of services, but even go beyond that, right? And knowing um, the ways in which governments can improve their lives. And also, you know, we've heard about the importance of being able to engage with those populations to really understand their situations and make a difference in their lives. And this is very much a a learning journey for everyone engaged. Um, We have this challenge that, as Adna mentioned, focus on that mainstreaming element of it, because it's important that it's not a one-off and it's important that we are taking care of all of, you know, uh, our our population, uh, particularly those that have been marginalized. And that is a ongoing recurring conversation and hence the importance of mainstream. And to say that we have amazing partners, um, you know, in the Carter Center, Accountability Lab, NDI, and many others do check the Open Cup Guide as well. We have there some other um, partners that are doing amazing work, but also look around you, some of our local members and beyond that are doing great work, like the Basque Country, like, uh, you know, Peñalolén and many others that have been working with those marginalized groups. So please, you know, uh, continue to engage with us and our community. Um, you know, we have the challenge, we have many other uh, spaces for discussion and collaboration. And the next discussion is going to be around anti-corruption, it's going to be next week, Wednesday as well, you'll be getting information about that very soon. We're going to be looking at anti-corruption, as I just said. So with that, and with just three minutes over, I want to thank Everybody, our speakers, our participants, again, a really interesting and good conversation in the chat. Um, We'll be uh, sending out uh, information about this so that you have the links, the video, everything is going to be online. Again, thank you so much for everybody, our speakers, our participants, and I really hope that you've enjoyed this webinar as much as I have. With that, We'll let you go on to your next call meeting, or perhaps uh, it's time to uh, finish the day and go enjoy your families. Thank you so much, everybody.